think about an addict as somebody who's out on the street. It is literally the person next door most of the time. I started using marijuana drinking about eighth grade. Slowly escalated. It went from that to harder drugs as far as crack, coke, Xanax. I just wanted to feel different. I didn't love myself. I didn't put myself in positions to love myself. Unfortunately, stories like this are far too common in communities across the country. So many have been affected by the deadliest, most widespread drug epidemic in U.S. history. Starting in the 1980s and 90s, a multitude of factors collided, creating a perfect storm that resulted in the opioid crisis we are battling today. The pharmaceutical industry pursued aggressive marketing campaigns for prescription opioids, assuring the healthcare community and the public that opioids weren't addictive. Insufficient and often lacking collaboration among state prescription monitoring databases and between state and medical licensing boards contributed to a blind eye approach. The Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations introduced new pain management standards in 2000, classifying pain as the fifth vital sign. This led to an incomplete and misplaced focus on reducing pain at any cost. Heroin became readily available, potent, and cheap. Patients demanded fast and easy treatments for any discomfort. A number of corrupt physicians and other healthcare providers got involved in cash-based pill mills. On the whole, healthcare providers were not making the connection between chronic pain and treatment and addiction, and were prescribing opioids without considering a whole host of related pain factors, such as socioeconomic issues, adverse childhood experiences, psychological conditions, and many other forms of stress. Overprescribing opioid medications created a vicious cycle of widespread misuse of prescription painkillers like Oxycontin, Percocet, and Vicodin, before it became clear that these medications were indeed highly addictive. At the same time, street versions of opioids, especially heroin, became readily available, potent, and cheap. After more than 20 years of wrecked communities, families torn apart, and lives lost, Health and Human Services finally declared a public health emergency in 2017. 10.3 million people misused prescription opioids in 2018. 15,349 deaths attributed to heroin overdose. 2 million people had an opioid use disorder in 2018. Tennessee is one of the hardest hit states. In 2018, there were 1,307 overdose deaths involving opioids. This means there are nearly four overdose deaths per day in Tennessee annually. After interventions such as regulating pain management clinics and introducing prescription drug monitoring laws, deaths involving prescription opioids decreased from 739 in 2016 to 550 in 2018. However, the increased regulations led to a spike in use of illegal street drugs, such as heroin. Deaths involving heroin increased from 311 in 2017 to 369 in 2018. The greatest increase in opioid deaths was seen in cases involving fentanyl, a synthetic and extremely potent opioid that is 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine and is often made and used illegally. Death tolls rose from 590 in 2017 to 827 in 2018. Anyone can become dependent on these powerful drugs. Opioid addiction is an equal opportunity disease. It does not discriminate against race, gender, or socioeconomic status. Addiction is a chronic brain disease that ultimately hijacks the prefrontal cortex the part of the brain that allows us to make logical choices like showing up to work and using our paycheck to pay bills. Before a person can even consider whether it's a good idea to pop another pill or stick a syringe in their arm, the limbic system and midbrain are screaming for the rush of dopamine that drugs provide. Hey, well, each relapse to me got worse because I would want to feel a different high, I wanted to feel something different. The first few times I'd go in, it'd be for just like marijuana or drinking. And then you'd go into treatment, you'd get clean, come back out and start off 100 miles an hour where you left off. So each time I got out, it got a little bit worse. Got pregnant when I was about 22 and 
I got a prescription for Percocet tens. I had a cesarean done. I felt like I probably went through postpartum depression and it kind of opened up Pandora's box and it kind of just kept on escalating from there. Stress, psychological conditions, and adverse childhood experiences play a huge role in who is most vulnerable to addiction. Knowing some of the signs and symptoms can be the difference in catching addiction early. Are they growing distant from friends and family? Have their activities of daily living, ADLs, changed drastically? They may start missing work regularly, mismanaging finances, and stealing from friends and family to pay for drugs. Do you or someone you know need help? The statistics are staggering, and the personal struggles are overwhelming, but there is hope. There are pathways to recovery. The first step is detoxification and medically managed withdrawal. The patient is then assessed by an addictionologist and placed on one of these paths to recovery. In long-term residential treatment, patients with a serious addiction will stay in the facility 24-7 from 6 to 12 months. Then there's the short-term path, where patients stay in the facility 24-7 from 3 to 6 weeks. They receive intense but brief treatment based on a modified 12-step approach. They receive extended outpatient therapy following inpatient treatment. With outpatient treatment, the patient has a wide variety of options. These patients may still have their job and support from their network. Individualized drug counseling focuses on reducing and stopping illicit drug use. It addresses related areas of impaired functioning, such as employment status, illegal activity, and family and social relations. Ultimately, it helps patients develop coping strategies. Group counseling gives individuals struggling with addiction the space to talk through their struggles and gain social reinforcement from peers. On top of group session, patients get individualized drug counseling. There are many obstacles that people face in getting help, but cost doesn't have to keep you or a loved one from receiving treatment. Did you know that treatment facilities like Cadis and Chattanooga receive federal grant money each year to cover the costs associated with opioid addiction treatment? CADIS offers services for every stage of the recovery process, from outpatient to residential treatment. Focus Treatment Centers is another facility that offers both residential and outpatient programs. Volunteer Comprehensive Treatment Center administers both methadone and suboxone and specializes in opioid use disorder. The Hamilton County Coalition is offering a New Start program that offers a wide range of treatment and recovery services for opioid dependency. No matter where you live in Tennessee, there is help. The Tennessee Red Line is a 24-7 addiction hotline that connects Tennessee residents with state-funded addiction treatment and recovery. It's miserable using that cycle of using every hour of the day. We'll seek help, go to treatment. You're not alone. There's people out there that care. And there is hope out there. I'm a father to my son. I'm a son to my parents again. I actually can hold a job. I'm a productive member of society, and it's, it all started with asking for help.